With every day that passes my need for even a morsel of information on the next Fable game grows, so what better way for me to feed that need than by continuing where I left off my last Fable video as I press on to its sequel to answer the question, can you beat Fable 2 without increasing any skills? Much like its predecessor, Fable 2 is built around your basic RPG mechanics. You kill things, get experience, and then use said experience to make yourself stronger in whatever way you see fit. So, just like in the previous Fable video, the goal is to see if it's possible to reach the end of the game's main quest without spending any experience. Thankfully in the Fable series, collecting experience doesn't automatically level you up like in most games, so at the very least, I don't need to worry whether I pick up some of the many glowing orbs. Quick note before jumping into the game, on the Series X, a lot of 360 games recently got an FPS boost update, so they all look and run a little bit smoother. Despite the fact Fable Anniversary and Fable 3 both got these improvements, for some reason Fable 2 was left completely untouched. It's a little disappointing, but for what it's worth it shouldn't affect all that much. Now, with all that out of the way, let's begin. Just like in Fable 1, the story begins with us taking control of a gremlin posing as a human child. The only difference is this time, rather than having a father who will haunt your dreams, your parents are instead dead, so there is an improvement. The opening also has us get shit on by a bird. Some say this is a sign of good luck, I say it is a metaphor for how this run might go. Hello there, young Rose. You look hungry. Investigating the nearby hustle and bustle, we come across a trader selling secret artifacts for five gold pieces each. This results in us meeting Teresa from the first game, who has done a fantastic job of recovering from the dose of death I dealt her. She convinces me and my sister to do odd jobs around the town in the hopes of collecting enough gold to purchase the wish granting music box. If that sounds at all familiar, it's because it is very similar to how the first game began. That said, Fable 2's child segment is objectively better for three reasons. Firstly, you have access to some actual weapons, so I don't have to rely on my oversized hands for clobbering. Secondly, you get a pet dog who will automatically become your best friend on the journey. And finally, and most important of all, you can fulfill everyone's lifelong dream of laughing at James Corden as you proceed to ruin his life. Before long, the five gold coins have been gathered and we get to make our wish. Naturally, the game just started, so things don't pan out how you would want. It's not a fable game if you aren't immediately punished by the deaths of your friends and loved ones, so to that end, Lucian, the main villain, kills both you and your sister. Well, your sister dies, but you manage to survive despite getting tossed around like a crash test dummy. You then get saved by Teresa and your dog, before the game then skips 10 years, and now things can truly begin. I start by grabbing the weapons and items I need from the chest near my caravan, and can head out into the world. At this stage, leveling up is still off limits, so for now, things proceed how they would in a normal playthrough. I get the guild seal from Teresa, and lucky for us, she doesn't have you on speed dial like the guild master from the last game. It's really a glorified key for the time being, as I use it to unlock the entrance to the now buried guild, and make my way through the cave. The only resistance is that of some beetles, but again, this is still the tutorial all things considered, so squishing them was never going to be much trouble. After a bit, I fight my way to the chamber of fate. Sadly, this time I cannot glitch through the floor and obtain an end game weapon before intended. I can, however, open this chest and get an energy sword along with the armor of John Halo. We will not be using any of this stuff today though, that comes at a later date. This is where we hit our first hurdle though, and it's kind of a big one. To proceed, I am required to shoot magic at this glowing red orb to open the Cullis Gate to get back outside. Thing is, unlike before, magic isn't just given to you by the Guildmaster, instead you have to unlock it with some of your experience. I tried for a while to find a way past, but it became clear pretty quick that I would need to use magic to proceed, so I bought the cheapest spell I could and used it to open the gate, so no, you cannot beat Fable 2 without increasing any skills. That said, I wanted to press on and see how far I could get without spending any more. I also went back into the level up screen after activating the portal and refunded the fireball spell, essentially putting me back down to what could be considered level 1, and also making this a new magic run from this point on I guess. After teleporting out, it's off to Barstone. Except not really, because recent bandit HACTIVITY, as the guard calls it, has caused the roads to close. Never one to turn down a chance for some legally sanctioned murder, I made my way to the bandits and began to throw down. It's an easy battle with Thag and his men, the only difference between this and a normal playthrough is that I would probably have the ability to block or dodge by now, but given this run, that's not going to happen. It's not a huge deal, one does not need to dodge if you just slowly pelt your attackers with crossbow bolts until they stop moving. Looting Thag's cabin gets me a key for the nearby cage, allowing me to free some slaves. But, as this is Fable, a random bandit appears and offers me gold in exchange for the key, because there's nothing this series loves more than morally black and white dilemmas. XP is good and all, but money is where true power lies, so I hand over the key for a paltry sum of gold. After receiving said payment, I decide to go with secret option C by turning the safety off of my crossbow and taking the key back by force. The prisoners, confused at what just transpired, run off back to the gypsy camp, and I begin the very long walk to Barstone. 
The shops in town are filled with useful weapons and items that will definitely help me on my adventures given my lack of natural strength. Problem being, all the really good stuff is far too expensive to afford right now. You may recall a similar problem in the Fable Anniversary version of this challenge that I was able to bypass by spending nearly an hour believing in the heart of the cards. Unfortunately, I'm not as good a gambler in this one, so I have to look to other means to procure my fortune, and as of right now, the best source of income is helping the local blacksmith. Just like before, I did this for an extended period of time until I had enough money to buy a steel longsword, an iron clockwork rifle, as well as some much needed cosmetic and fashion upgrades. For anyone curious, there's a link to the unedited video in the description, just in case you enjoy the idea of Fable Blacksmithing ASMR. Anyway, back to what matters, I meet with Teresa yet again, where she gives me a brief exposition dump before sending me on my way to Oakfield to find the Hero of Strength. Before leaving Barstone, I invest the last of my money in housing as I buy and rent out as many houses as I can afford, and since landlords are in fact agents of the devil, I jack everyone's rent up to an absurd degree. The game clearly agrees with this sentiment, as it's not long before I grow horns and become a secret lizard person. To be fair, I don't help matters as I gun down the first innocent person I spotted outside of the town. In my defence, he was looting a wrecked carriage, so as far as we're aware, he caused the crash. I am able to be a little more righteous soon after, as I scuffle with some more bandits. Unlike Thag's group, these ones are carrying guns, and it's pretty clear the game wants me to take the time to get to use my own firearms. While that's all well and good, and my iron rifle isn't the worst, it ends up being a lot quicker to just run up and stab them to death with my sword. For what it's worth, when I made it to the broken bridge, I did try to get some use out of the rifle by taking out the bandits taunting me to kill myself, but as of right now, they appear to be invincible. Giving in to peer pressure, I leap off the bridge, and thanks to my excellent form, land safely in the water, and can swim to the nearby cave, where like always, someone is screaming for my help. Herman here wants me to find his son who wandered off into the cave. You would expect us to find him right as rain and get a nice gold reward, but that's where you're wrong because Fable hates children and will take any opportunity to torment them that it gets. As such, little Dewey is both a hob and dead. On the bright side, that does mean I get to fight something other than bandits and beetles for the time being. Hobs can hit pretty hard in the mid to late game when they start to use magic, but as of right now, they are harmless little dumplings that I just toss around the area until the game says stop. After I put a dent in the local hob population, I get back outside and immediately head the wrong way to teach those bandits a lesson on why they should never pick on the quiet kid. Not long after, I arrive in Oakfield and I begin to expand my horizons as I start purchasing up small shops as well as houses. I also make another upgrade to my arsenal when I replace my iron rifle with a steel blunderbuss. Sure, the blunderbuss kind of defeats the purpose of being a ranged weapon, but its stopping power is a sight to behold. Pushing on with the main quest, I head up to the Temple of Light, who, just like before, still want all of your money. But for now, I do need to impress the abbot if I want to continue. This is one of three points in the game where you're required to have a certain amount of renown if you want to pass. Essentially, it is to encourage the player to partake in side quests and the like. To begin with, I decide to fuel my hero's ego by having dancing statues made in my likeness spread to every town I can find, and then helping Barnum in the tavern with his bandit problem. It's very much like the quest with Thag earlier, only this time the bandit leader Dash doesn't fight you directly, but instead runs at the first sight of danger. To be fair, I too would run if I was being approached by an elegantly dressed demon with a shotgun. Speaking of the shotgun... It is very good. As you can imagine, with this it isn't long before I reach Dash at Stonehenge and give him a taste of the same medicine that I just fed all of his men. With the bandits gone, I can now return to Barstone where I show off trophies and play my loot for a few minutes to make me famous enough to help out the abbot. All I have to do is help the abbot's daughter collect enough water so they can save their magical tree. It's not as straightforward as walking down to the local lake and filling the thing, but instead we have to make our way through yet another cave and collect the special water. While this is happening, I have to protect the abbot's daughter from the onslaught of Hollowmen. My weapons are of course a little overpowered for the current point of the story, so the majority of the Hollowmen go down to either one shotgun blast to the midsection, or if I'm feeling fancy, two swings from my steel sword. The pseudo end boss of the cave is the Headless Hollow Man, because by game logic, him not having a head makes him stronger than those that do. Well, not having a head means a severe lack of vision, so I'm easily able to evade his attacks by just slowly walking around him while I shoot him with the blunderbuss. After about four shots, I move in for a couple of sword strikes, and just like that, he goes down. Hannah then finishes things up by blessing the water, but seeing how things are going well, the game decides now it is time for her to become a hero, meaning she must be an orphan, and thus her very much alive father is next on the chopping block. Or I suppose next in front of the firing squad would be more appropriate. It is truly a sad scene as we mourn the death of the character who refused to help me because I wasn't famous enough. But then Teresa appears and Hannah decides to rename herself Hammer and becomes the hero of strength. Before I head for the next main objective, I decide it wouldn't be the worst idea to get some extra renown before the next mandatory segment that requires it in the story. 
I ended up helping out Sam and Max with a summoner's quest, which is simply head to the Barstone Cemetery and re-kill 100 Hollowmen. An easy enough task seeing how fast I dealt with the ones in Oakfield, but to make things even quicker, I used my tenant's hard earned money to upgrade to a steel katana. It doesn't do as much base damage as the steel sword, but what it lacks in power it makes up for with extra reach and a lot more speed. After I have zandatsu the last of the zombies, I claim my reward as well as some renown. Want to hear something interesting? Between the last sentence and this one, four days have passed between recording sessions. Any other game this would not matter, but you see, Fable 2 has this interesting feature where you will continue to earn money from any of your rented out properties and shops even when you aren't on the game. So as soon as I load back in, I get just over 27,000 gold. In the grand scheme of things that's not a lot I know, but when it comes time to upgrade my weapons again, I won't have to work as a blacksmith for another 30 plus minutes. Enough sidetracking though, I head back to the guild to get my next task, and right away I'm sent to Brightwood to track down the second hero, the Hero of Will. It's not as smooth as meeting Hammer because as soon as I arrive I'm met with floating ships and spire guards. The guards are tougher than your normal bandits as you might expect, and can shrug off multiple shots from the blunderbuss like they were nothing. Attacking them with a flurry of sword strikes isn't always viable either, as they are prone to blocking after a few direct hits. Normally, if you were a melee focused build this wouldn't be an issue as you would just flourish to break their guards. But unlike Fable 1 where you always have the ability to flourish, in Fable 2 you have to level up the Brutal Style skill to unlock it. So in other words, not only do I have no defensive options, but I also lack any way outside of my ranged weapons to get past enemies who are blocking. Mash all this together with an increasing number of enemies to face all at once, and this battle with the Spire Guards ends up draining me of a lot more of my resources than I care to admit. Not only did I lose a lot of food and potions off of healing, but a couple of the guards managed to get in some lucky hits, draining me of all my health and using my resurrection vials. This would probably be the best time to mention that unlike in the first game, clothing and armour is completely cosmetic in Fable 2. The only way to take more hits is to increase your health and toughness, and with that not being an option for me, expect most enemies to two-shot me from this point going forward. After a lot of perseverance, potions and peanuts, I am able to come out on top and make it to Garth. Unfortunately, I did not account for the appearance of Darth Maul, who swips in with his Force Lightning and kidnaps our wizardy friend. With the task failed successfully, I was meant to head back to the guild once again, but as my weapons are reaching their limit, I came to the conclusion that I would need to go out of my way to secure myself some more firepower if I wanted to make things as painless as possible. Still in Brightwood, I made my way to the nearby farms and spoke with Giles, the retired guard captain. Like a lot of quests so far, he wants me to deal with a nearby bandit menace, which I of course do without much trouble. The reward I want isn't available just yet, but completing this quest is one of the prerequisites to get to appear later on. After this I made a journey to as many weapon traders as I could think of to try and find some better equipment, but in the end nothing was better than what I already had. Instead I spent the money on potions and food, before figuring out where to go next from the exposition lady. To track down Garth we need to find out more about Lucian, the man who was killing orphans like it was going out of style in the intro. To do that we need to find his old butler Jeeves, because no one on the team was smart enough to think of an original name for the English butler. Oddly enough, he's just chilling around the tavern in Barstone where he demands 1000 gold for the location of Lucian's diary, which will give us the knowledge that we need. I can obviously afford this price of knowledge, but that doesn't mean I don't kill him after the fact and take it back. The map leads me to Bar Lake, and our first proper boss fight I suppose, that being a forest troll. Sadly, this time I don't have any mind blowing revelations on how to easily dispatch trolls like I did with the boulder bouncing trick in Fable Anniversary, as this time the only way to hurt them is to attack the glowing tendrils that sprout out of their body. The trolls are a lot slower than they were before, so evading their attacks is as simple as just walking slightly to the left or right of where the shockwaves are going to be. The blunderbuss does wonders against him as I slowly circle him, taking out each of his glowy bits until he eventually goes down. My dog then leads me to the diary like the good boy that he is, and after a little blind reading I finally get to work alongside Hammer as we make our way to Westcliff to fight in the arena. Kinda like in the original. First we have to make a through bandit coast, and it should probably go without saying what we encounter here. It's not as easy as it's been up till now though, as now the bandits have seemingly gone through a significant upgrade as they have learnt how to block, much like the spire guards. Hammer can incapacitate some of them leading to very quick kills on my end, which is always welcome. And if nothing else, she also helps to divert attention away from my glass bones and paper skin. I may have gotten a little too confident in my abilities here as one of the bandits knocks me down for the very first time. So unlike most games when your health is depleted, you don't die and have to retry from an earlier save or checkpoint in Fable 2, but rather you get knocked out for a moment and the game steals some experience from you for being an idiot. This means in a run like this where experience orbs are just glowing paperweights, getting knocked out really doesn't do anything besides waste my time. Which in a weird way almost makes it worse. Also because somebody will ask, when you get back up after you've been knocked down, your character automatically fires off a blast of energy that pushes any nearby enemies away. 
This blast is technically counted as a spell, and as such, you gain a few will experience orbs if you hit someone with it. Theoretically, this means if there was a way to somehow get knocked unconscious in the Chamber of Fate at the beginning, that the blast may be able to deactivate the colour skin. But as far as I'm aware, there is no way to get knocked down in there. Still though, it's food for thought. Back to what's happening on screen, as you can see, I am still doing okay against the bandits, all things considered. In fact, they introduce another new variant, that being the Highwayman, and to be completely honest, they are very easy to kill. After passing the bandit coast, we make it onto the road to Westcliff, but just as that happens, we get assaulted by Balverines and their queen, who is posing as a human. Thankfully though, a few shots reveal her true intentions. Fighting the Balverines was initially something I was very worried about, as they are incredibly fast and aggressive, which is usually not a good combination for someone who cannot protect themselves. But either it was down to dumb luck or an exploit in their programming, I was able to find a relatively foolproof way to deal with them. Staying at a medium distance and shooting would always cause them to follow up with a pounce attack that just like the forest troll shockwaves could be very easily avoided by slowly circling them. I would then fire another shot, they would get ready to pounce, and then I could rinse and repeat until the area was clear. Or in the case of the Highland Halls, I could stall for time until Hammer made us a makeshift bridge to escape and could make it to Westcliff and get prepared for the arena. Thanks to all of the funds I've been hoarding, I was able to now purchase a Master Pistol and a Master Katana from the Weaponsmith in Westcliff. As I am about to go into the arena, I want as much of an advantage as possible, so I travelled back to Barstone and got some augments for the katana. The two augments I figured that would help the most in the long run were the ghoul and golden touch augments. The ghoul augment heals me on every successful hit, so staying on the offensive was now something I could reasonably do, and golden touch got me money with each kill. Honestly, it's not really necessary, but the way I see it, you can never have too much money in this game. As ready as I could ever be, it was time to throw myself at the arena. The first three rims of the crucible only had hobs and beetles, so for the most part, nothing that would cause too much damage. That said, I did get one shot by one of the magic hobs that I mentioned earlier. This also caused a weird visual bug where the words Room 3 would stay on the screen throughout the rest of my time in the arena. Room 4 contained hollow men. They were a little bit more resilient than those I faced before, but the ghoul augment helped to offset any damage they inflicted, as they would all clump together, allowing me to hit multiple at once and stay at full health. Rooms 5 and 6 were just bandits. Surprisingly, these two rooms actually took the longest to clear out, as I kept getting knocked around by the overabundance of explosive barrels in the area. The Master Pistol may not be as strong as the Blunderbuss, but I won't lie, having a ranged weapon with some actual range was a big help when it came to picking the bandits off at a safe distance. Room 7, the penultimate room, was of course Balverine's. And while I intended to just rely on the ranged exploit from earlier, I instead wanted to see how much better the Master Katana fared. The answer? It worked a lot better. Once more, the Ghoul Augment comes in clutch here as I use the high speed of the Katana to lock down a single Balverine, and should they manage to break free and damage me, I can just strike them right back to regain whatever health was lost. As you can see, this even worked on the White Balverine as well. With that, it was on to the final room, the Rock Troll. While he is bigger than the Forest Troll, and the arena is a lot more confined, the same strategy as before works wonders. Plus, now I don't have to stand within spitting distance just to do damage. The inclusion of a couple of hobs halfway through the battle slowed my progress a little as I had to deal with them to avoid being overrun, but with some careful movement and a lot of patience, I was able to come out on top and win the Crucible. Winning gets me fame, a little fortune, and the ability to travel to the Spire as one of Lucian's newly recruited guards and play through the worst segment in the game. Before leaving, I also invested some money with Barnum, so that when I returned, Westcliff would look a little less shit. You can tell this is an important moment in the story, because it's one of the handful of times the game treats you with a CG cutscene. Getting off the boat, me and the rest of the unfortunate souls forced to go along with this prison segment come face to face with Lucian, and if the guardsmen hadn't taken my weapons, this would probably be the end of the game. But as it stands, we have a few more hours to kill, so Lucian puts us all down for a nap, where he then shaves my golden locks and strips me of my fashion sense, probably because he felt awkward that we both showed up in the same coat. Anyway, while I'm stuck in this hell, I have to follow the orders of the Commandant. That's the Darth Maul looking gentleman from before, by the way. Well, I say have to follow his orders, but really, it's a lot more fun to continue to disobey him at every possible moment you can. This ranges from giving him the finger, feeding prisoners, and even attacking him with a sword that he stupidly gives you. Sure, every time you disobey, the Fallout Slave Collar around your neck fries the life out of you, but really all it does is rob you of some experience, so what have I got to lose here? For 10 years I am stuck in the spire, and all the while I have to assume my guy continued to disobey the commandant, and you really have to wonder why he didn't just kill me during that time. He says it's because he wants to prove he can break you, but I figured at some point you have to realise the crazy mute with the devil horns is a lost cause. Well, at the 10 year mark he sends me on a quick mission to find a missing guardsman in the hopes to redeem myself, but surprise, when we get there it turns out Garth killed the guard, and is able to use what's left of his will to get rid of my collar. As you can imagine, this then leads to an escape sequence, just like any good prison segment. 
The only downside is none of my equipment is here, so I am forced to use a steel sword and clockwork pistol, and let's just say they are a far cry from my master weapons. Getting past the normal guards is straightforward enough by this point, it's when we make it to the Commandant's chambers that things get a bit dicey. I have now officially reached the stage of the game where I can be one shot by seemingly anything at random. This results in me just having to take pot shots at the Commandant between knockdowns until one last bullet is enough to put him down permanently. Garth then swoops in last minute to steal all the XP from me after my hard work. Can't complain I suppose, not like I was going to use it. It's actually good that he does this though as it means just like Hammer, he can now assist me in the upcoming skirmish. He may not draw as much attention as Hammer, but his spells certainly mop the floor with the nearby spire guards in a matter of moments. We then board one of the nearby ships, watch the CG cutscene but backwards, and arrive back at the shore to introduce Garth to Teresa, but most importantly, I get to reunite with Dog. Before continuing to the final stretch of the main quest, now was the time to go get that weapon from the farmer I spoke about before. The process to get it is a little long but straightforward, so I will go over it rather quickly. Basically, I return back to Giles at his farm where he has another quest for me, this time it's to find a suitable wife for his son. Only thing is, his son is gay, so instead I do the right thing and set him up with a bachelor in the city, which completes the quest, and allowing me to buy the farm off of Giles once he leaves for Barstone. Why is this important? Well, once you purchase the house you can head upstairs and find an old key that opens a portcullis in the basement and after fighting through some rather impressively brittle hollow men, can dig in the spot indicated by your dog where you will find the Enforcer. The Enforcer has the highest single base damage out of any gun, so this is pretty much the most amount of damage I can do with ranged weaponry from here on out. Next it's back to Brightwood Tower, only this time I have backup, and I'm not talking about Hammer and Garth. To explain how powerful this is, think of the normal blunderbuss as the base shotgun in Doom 2016. It's pretty good and can definitely get the job done, but the Enforcer is like the fully upgraded super shotgun. It hits very hard and tears through everything in its path at the drawback of slightly less range. All the Spire Guards go down to one or two shots, making the defense of Garth here an absolute cakewalk. The Katana does get some love here too. That said, I will also be replacing it shortly, but more on that in a bit. Once the portal is ready, I step through first, and after I briefly adjust to the environment, I decide to lie down for a quick snooze. When I awake, I have been taken prisoner by a man who looks eerily like the Crypt Keeper from Lynchfield Graveyard. I don't have very long to ponder this though, as we appear to have entered Silent Hill. My captor does the only logical thing and runs headfirst into the approaching fog, and as you might expect, dies a horrible death off screen. At this point, all hope seems lost, but proving to be the real MVP of this run, Dog comes strolling up with the keys and frees me from my imprisonment. I take a moment to look at the Oakville sign and think about Fable 1, before sprinting as fast as I possibly can through the fog and onto my next boss encounter, a Banshee. The Banshee cannot be harmed initially, but rather you have to take out her children and yet another display of Lionhead sheer hatred towards kids. Once they are out of the picture, you have a very limited time frame to attack the Banshee directly. Thanks to having the Enforcer in my back pocket, I can too cycle the Banshee with ease and be on my merry way. After the Banshee, the only things that try to stop you are more Banshees and a few Hollowmen. The second needs to be killed and goes down just the same as the first, as for the hollow men, I opt to just run past them as it's not worth my time to stop and fight them. I then make my way for Bloodstone and as soon as I arrive I immediately leave as this is the third and final Renown gate before the end of the game and currently I am about 8000 points short. While that may sound like an absolutely absurd amount, by this stage the side quests give on average 4000 apiece so I only have to complete two of them. First off I tackle the Something Rotten quest which tasks me with figuring out the recent pollution problem near the Rookridge Inn. The problem? A forest troll. The solution? Gun. The next side quest I decided on was Evil in Wraith Marsh, simply because it was the follow up to the summoner's quest from earlier. Before proceeding though, it was now time to make the last upgrade to my arsenal. Back at Brightwood Tower, there is now a new path open by jumping down into this broken tower. The wiki describes this place as a puzzle dungeon as there's no enemies to be fought, but there is nothing taxing about these puzzles. Do you have eyes? Can you see the colours blue and yellow? If you answered yes to both of these questions, congratulations you are smart enough to claim what is considered the best melee weapon in the entire game, which awaits you at the end of the cave. The weapon in question is the Dai Chi, that's right another katana, because I guess I just cannot help myself. It has a higher base damage than my master katana, as well as some stronger augments to boot. As powerful as I could possibly be, it was time to see about wrapping things up. First up, as the side quest's name implies, it was back to Wraith Marsh to locate Sam and Max who were at the bottom of a well being harassed by a small army of hollowmen. Somehow they managed to survive, and they inform me of a banshee that will now be on its way to Bloodstone. One fast travel and just loading screen later and it's time to kill me yet another banshee. This was actually the easiest one yet. Turns out the Dai Chi absolutely decimates the banshee when its defences are down. I then return to Barstone to flip off the brothers, claim my renown, and then return to Bloodstone to see about helping Reaver with his tasks so I can recruit him to my circle of friends. 
The first thing that Stephen Fry here wants me to do is take this incredibly ominous looking symbol back to Wraith Marsh and use it to open an ancient door. Doesn't sound the least bit shady at all. As I have the mental fortitude of Mr Bean however, I go along with this request. From the outset it looks like any other dungeon or cave system. When you get a little further in though, you start to fight shadowy versions of Hobbs, Bandits and Balverines. They may look edgy and intimidating, but in actuality they are about as strong as their colourful counterparts, so the Enforcer once more gets to strut its stuff as I obliterate whatever stands in my way with superior firepower. Once the apparitions are dealt with I jump into a spooky hole where I'm greeted by the Shadow Men. They have a simple request, give up my youth for Reaver, or hand the dark seal to the woman next to me and have her be turned into a bag of wrinkles instead. I did not spend all this time fighting through the game without levelling up to have my hero succumb to natural causes in a few years off screen, so to that end I slip the dark seal in her pocket and emerge from the cave looking as handsome as ever. For what it's worth, Teresa also believes this was the right choice, as I'm not going to be able to stop Lucian if I need a Zimmer frame. Returning to Reaver and I bear witness to the emotional scene as Barnum, my friend and business partner, is executed right before my very eyes. Before I can shove the Daichi with a sundown shiny, Reaver reveals his plans to turn me over to Lucian, only for him to betray Reaver in the process. Paying no mind to the whole Reaver betrayal thing, the two of us make our way through the back passage, dealing with the Spire Guards the whole time. I don't think I need to go over this very much, they don't appear to pack any more of a punch than the rest of the guards thus far, so the Enforcer is more than enough to carve a path through them, with a little assistance from the Daichi. Making it outside just in time for the beach episode, and it's time for the final boss. No, it's not Lucian, and it's certainly not a dragon like in the Lost Chapters. The final boss is in fact a giant spinning pyramid. Wonderful. To be honest, it's more of a battle with the never-ending reinforcements of Spire Guards and Commandants, while Garth zaps the thing with lightning. Having all three of the heroes backing you up here makes this a lot more manageable than if you were by yourself. Reaver and Hammer take the brunt of the attention, while I swoop in and clean up the mess. I had a feeling in the pit of my stomach that I would be required to spend experience here, as I could have sworn that you need to shoot the thing with a shock spell for it to be vulnerable. Apparently that is not the case, and just waiting for Garth to hit it is all it's required. This was also the one time the Enforcer was not the best choice, as its pitiful range meant that I wasn't inflicting anywhere close to max damage as the shard was keeping its distance from me. So it was an almost never ending cycle of clearing out mooks with Reaver and Hammer, followed by some light shooting the shard and then protecting Garth, and then just repeating until the job was done. I actually wasn't even aiming at the Mega Shard when I delivered the final blue, I was trying to hit the smaller one in front of me, and I guess it just got caught in the blast. With that, Teresa appears and the five of us are whisked away to the top of Hero Hill, where after a pretty light show, all hell breaks loose. Teresa disappears in the blinding light, Lucian appears and kidnaps the three heroes, he kills my dog, and then he tries to kill me. Not sure why he thinks a single shot will kill me as a fully grown adult, when that combined with a very lethal fall didn't work when I was like eight. I then wake up in hell where I'm forced to do menial tasks like shoot bottles, harass chickens and commit mass genocide on beetles every day until the sun goes down. Or if you've played the game before you know that you can just sleep in the bed immediately, run towards the spooky gate and after trekking through Lauren for a bit, reunite with the music box from the beginning. The game then goes over the most important parts of your journey and how you've grown thus far, which would look a lot better if my physical appearance had altered at all, or if I even changed my outfit once a single time during the last 10 years. With my existential crisis over I wake up in the spire, load my enforcer and get ready to face down Lucian. When I make it to the top he's in the middle of absorbing energy from the three, but if I can't have experience, no one can, so I play the song of my people from the music box, severing his connection from them and making him vulnerable. With the barrier down you can listen to his speech, but in doing so you risk him being killed by Reaver, so to make sure I get the glory I just pull the trigger before he can even open his mouth. With that the day is saved, but before the game ends I am presented with three wishes. Do I want to be Moses and save the slaves? Do I want one million gold dollars? Or do I want to wish my sister and dog back to life? Naturally I just chose to bring back my loved ones because first off I owe the dog for saving me in Wraith Marsh and this will make us even, and secondly the comments would skin me alive if I just let the dog stay dead. But with that my wish is granted, I reunite with my furry friend, ending the game and proving no you cannot beat Fable 2 without increasing any skills. It's certainly annoying that the challenge failed so early in the run having to open the Cull's Gate in the guild, but for what it's worth I was glad to see you could get through every other part of the game after that point without ever needing to spend a drop of experience. The early and end game were certainly the easiest parts of the run due to the weaponry I was able to get hold of, but the midpoint from Brightwood all the way until I got out of the spire was such a slog at times with how fast the enemies would kill me if I made even the slightest mistake. Anyway I hope you all enjoyed having another Fable run, hopefully we will get a release date for the new game soon, and when that happens I will officially begin working on the Fable 3 version of this challenge, which I already know will be hell. Regardless that's going to be in this challenge video, if you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like, and if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe to one of these videos every week. My name is Nerbit, so I say for one, I'll see you all in the next video.